prepare our hearts for worship. I think of Psalm 51 is just a wonderful psalm to, to read on your own time. It's one of my favorite psalms dealing with the issue of repentance. And David, as we know, committed adultery and murder and just uh, was a real, real sit, sad and wicked time in the life of David, but he was really brought to genuine repentance. But just the first verse, he says, Have mercy on me, God. According to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. <coughs> David knew that there was nothing that he had to offer God to have his sins blotted out and forgiven. He was asking God to forgive him and to blot out his transgressions on the basis of God's merciful character, on the basis of God's free grace. So as we prepare to worship today, we can be thankful and give thanks to God that he's willing to forgive us because of who he is and not because of what we've done. So let's just take a few moments just to pray. Just have a few moments with God, speak to him. If there's something that's on your heart that you need to confess, let's do it now. Uh, and then let's worship God with a, with a clear heart. He assures us that we're forgiven in Christ if we confess our sins. So let's take a few moments to pray. so sinful that we would sin our way out of your grace, but that you promise us that if we confess our sins, you are willing to forgive us, and you are just and righteous to forgive us freely through the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we ask that you be gracious to us today and forgive us for the ways in which we've offended you this week and this day, and we pray that you would receive our worship and our praise, Lord, above all, that you would be delighted uh, in your people here. We ask that you would be pleased to do this for the sake of Christ and his glory. And we ask in his name. Amen. This morning as I was driving over, I was reminded of John 15, where Jesus said, I am the vine, and you are the branches. You abide in me, and I in you, and you can bear much fruit. But apart from me, you can do nothing. I'm thankful that Jesus, in him, we can bear much fruit. We don't do it. We don't produce it. We just allow Him to live, flow through us. So I pray today that you uh, learn to abide in Jesus just a little bit more and allow His love to live through you. Just 
Gracious God and Father, we come before you this morning acknowledging that you indeed are God. Father, we thank you that you rule and overrule in the affairs of men. You indeed are a great God worthy of praise and honor and glory. Father, this 
this morning, we come before you corporately uh, as a body to give you the praise that you deserve. Lord, we, we thank you. We praise you for who you are, that you are a sovereign God. You're in control of all things. And Lord, we, we thank you high price that was paid on the cross. We know our salvation is free, but it was not cheap. It came at the highest of all prices, the shed blood of your son. Father, we thank you that you not only have forgiven us for all our sins, past, present, and future, but you have given us your righteousness, the righteousness that we must have that we don't have for ourselves. But we have your righteousness. The robe of righteousness that's wrapped around us. Father, we pray that today as we continue in our time of worship, as we, as we worship in song, praise and, and the ministry of the word. Father, we pray that your name would indeed be glorified. We pray this in the name of Jesus and for his sake. Amen. You may be seated. Please turn with me in your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. We're biting off a lot of sections now. Moving into chapter 2 and chapter 1, there was a lot to, to get through and just breaking up that giving of thanks and proclamation of blessings from the Apostle Paul. But there are sections here that we can take in a little more at time and work through as we work toward or through this, this precious epistle of the Apostle Paul. We'll read verses 11 through 16. In him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, and that's chapter one. I'm going to go back to chapter two, so. I thought you might have needed a reminder then. <laughs> chapter two, verses 11 through 16. Therefore remember that at one time you Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, which is made in the hands. Remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace. And he might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. Let's pray. Father, we are so privileged and encouraged to be able to consider your word together this morning. We thank you that we have your word. We thank you for what uh, the, the blood that was shed and the distances that people have gone to get us your word, even in the language that we can understand it. We pray, Father, that you would be pleased now that by your spirit to, to meet with us, to put these truths into our hearts. Lord, give us the grace to absorb what you have given us here today in this text. We pray that you would be gracious to us and that our sins would be forgiven and that we would hear from you and that you would make us more like Christ. Father, make us more and more 
and through the image of your Son that we might be well-pleasing to you and that we might serve you during this time of darkness surrounding us in this generation. Father, we ask, please have your way with us and do great things for the sake of your name, for the glory of your, your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and his kingdom. We pray in his name. Amen. Up to this point, for the most part, we have been witnessing the profound glory of all that God has done for us in Christ as individuals. However, throughout the course of all that Paul has been saying, we have also found him pulling back so as to give us a bigger picture of the grand scope of all that God is doing with and for his church, of which we are all part. And so Paul wants us to appreciate the individual sense of our salvation, but he also wants us to appreciate that we are no longer individuals in a very real sense. We are part of a body. While we are individuals in Christ, we have been joined together into a singular body of like believers who have experienced and are experiencing the same glorious blessings that come to all of God's regenerate children. We recall in chapter 1, verse 10, where Paul first opens up this idea of a mystery of God's will. That God's ultimate plan, the mystery is that God's ultimate plan is to unite all things in Christ, things in heaven and things on earth. Accomplishing this on earth, we saw how in Christ and by the Holy Spirit, God is reuniting all nations. He is merging Jew and Gentile together as one singular body in Christ. And this one body, known as the church, is willingly placed in subjection to Christ, who has been given as head over all things concerning the church. Well, this morning then, once again, the apostle is going to pull back and address us from the broader standpoint of our corporate identification, opening up the glory of the mystery of God's will, which is to join both Jew and Gentile into one body, into one church in Christ. And he will continue now with this broader theme until the end of chapter 3 before giving us the imperatives, that is the commands which we have to keep in light of all that God has done for us individually and corporately in Christ. And so as we observe the remainder of chapters 2 and 3, we will behold once again a glorious display of the very purpose for the continuing existence of this world. I love this section in Ephesians in chapter 1 and 2 and 3 because we really get a good understanding of why this world even continues to exist, what it's all about. And we'll see that especially moving forward now from the present text to the end of chapter 3. So let's consider then first the former hopeless state of the Gentiles. There's this corporate group that, that Paul labels the Gentiles, speaking of those who are outside uh, of Judea, the Judaistic context. They're non-Jews. The Gentiles were the heathen nations. Everything but Jew, usually associated with being Greek or Roman especially, was considered a Gentile. And so Paul reminds his Gentile readers, because the Ephesians were Gentiles primarily, of the profound privilege that they now have. A privilege which no Gentile nation has ever enjoyed since the time that God had confused the languages of all people groups at the Tower of Babel. That's when God separated the nations into languages. A new covenant has now dawned upon the world, having been ushered in by the Lord Jesus Christ, which would extend the reach of God's grace to the whole world. To have been given the profound privilege of receiving this present life, when for thousands of years your people have been kept in darkness, bound to the court curse of their fallen nature, without any hope of ever truly reaching God, is nothing ever to take lightly or for granted. And so Paul here wants his readers to delve deeply into a consideration of just how freely blessed they have been 
both in the individual sense, based upon their personal election, their regeneration, and their calling, but also in the corporate sense, based on how God has dealt with all nations prior to the coming of his Son. He begins then by stating in verses 11 and 12, he says, Therefore, remember that at one time you Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hands. Remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. And so here was the former state of the Gentiles, the non-Jews, which obviously would have included Paul's Ephesian audience, and probably most of us here in this room this morning, notice how Paul describes them. Notice what he says about the Gentiles here. First, he begins by saying, therefore, remember. Remember. What an important biblical concept that we often see dispersed throughout the scriptures, that word remember. How often does the Lord call his people to simply remember? How often are things repeated or brought forth from several angles to reiterate an important concept or command that God wants his people to grasp? Those of you who have read the entire Bible, there are times when you're reading through the Bible you feel like things are just constantly repeated over and over again. And that's intentional. And that's important because God wants us to remember. Even one of the Ten Commandments. The fourth commandment, which is probably one of the most neglected in our day, calls us, interestingly enough, to remember the Sabbath day. And how many customs and practices and holy days were the Jews given? All of these different kinds of holy days and practices, all of them were given to compel them to remember certain things that God had done for them so that they would not forget. Indeed, even the Lord's Supper, which we take here together every week, is in part a memorial service, isn't it? It is something that is meant to call to mind what Christ has done for us and the establishing of his new covenant through his shed blood for us, his covenant of grace. And there are symbols within the supper that we take that signify his vicarious, his substitutionary atonement on our behalf that are pictured in those elements, in those symbols, so that we remember. Now, brethren, why are we constantly bombarded by such charges to remember throughout the whole of Scripture? Is it not? Is it not? Because we are so prone to forget. If you're like me, then you know that we often forget. Is it not because we are so easily swept away by many distractions that would gradually lead us to forsake those precious truths that God calls us to hide in the inner recesses of our hearts? We are so easily distracted, especially when it comes to eternal truths. We are so sense-oriented, and yet the entire basis of our Christian faith is what? Faith-oriented. And so there's the need for a constant, diligent pursuit of simply remembering God and all that he commands us. We actually have to pursue remembering. It has to be something that we consciously do. We can't even just let it happen naturally because it won't. That's why we must read the scriptures and pray every single day of our lives. Because even in the course of one day, we can forget who we are and what this is all about, being swept away by temporal realities that appeal to our natural senses. We can, through the course of one day, we can be praising God one night, we can be excited about Christ one night and feel like we're on the top of Mount Zion. And then the next morning we get up and we're on our way to work 
and somebody maybe cuts us off, or maybe we get a flat tire, or something happens, and suddenly we act as if God doesn't exist. We don't remember even just that short amount of time. One of the great illustrations that I like to use sometimes when I'm thinking of these kinds of concepts in Scripture is, and this is very common in Long Island where I'm from in New York here, you're a little more bound by land, uh, but there are some areas that you can travel to to get to the water. And in Long Island, when you go to the beaches, you have to be careful because you can go out on a raft and some people like to lay down and put a hat over their head on back on that raft. But if you fall asleep, what happens? There's an undertow. And generally, that undertow doesn't bring you to shore. It brings you out further and further and further. And the longer you sleep, all of a sudden, 20, 25 minutes go by, and if you wake up, you say, how in the world did I get so far away from the shore? See, that's what it's like without forgetfulness is we're not in the Word continually. It's like we fall asleep, and we drift so far away, and we see, how do we get here? And so here, the Apostle Paul begins by charging his readers to remember, to remember the glorious privilege that they now have in the new covenant, lest they take it for granted and distance themselves from appreciating the glorious riches of God's grace toward them. And so, brethren, I stress this so much at the beginning of this message. Spend so much time just on this concept of remembering, because as we go through these first three chapters of Ephesians, you're going to need to remember, and you're going to be prone to forget, but you're going to need to remember if you're going to find the desire and the zeal to obey what's coming in chapters 4 through 6. So Paul says, first, to remember. Then he moves on and says, secondly, therefore remember, he specifically gives them the information to remember, that at one time, you Gentiles in the flesh, called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, which is made in the flesh by the hands. Now pause there for a moment. Paul reminds them of a critical spiritual reality that was further signified by a physical reality. God had given the Jews and the Gentiles something physical that could help point to a spiritual reality, or at least ought to have, even though the Jews had often failed to see what circumcision really represented. You see, they being Gentiles, lacking the circumcision that is made in the flesh by the hands, which the Jews had, they having been given a label called the uncircumcised by the old covenant people of God who were called the circumcised, they were given this label for a particular reason that spoke of their spiritual condition. God gave them something physical to which the people of God could identify with and identify the heathen with so that they would understand something spiritual. In other words, their outward lack, the Gentiles, of the physical sign of circumcision once pointed to a dreadful spiritual lack that plagued them for centuries upon centuries. And what did their uncircumcision point to? What did their lack of having this sign in their flesh point to? What was the spiritual reality to which their lack of physical circumcision pointed? Well, Paul says, thirdly, remember that you were at that time, here it is, this is what it pointed to, you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. Notice, he repeats that call to remember, right? He says, remember, and then he goes on and says, remember that you were at that time separated. Paul grabs them here, as it were, firmly by the conscience, so that they would not lose their focus on what he is seeking to convey to them here. Indicated, he says, by your lack of circumcision, you, and you see this in the sign of your flesh even, but the spiritual reality is more important. He says, you were once separated from Christ. The relationship that you now freely enjoy with the Christ, Paul says, whom you have now come to love, the son of the only living God, 
that relationship was once inaccessible to you and your people. You had no access. You were the uncircumcised. You were the heathen outsiders. And as such, you were altogether cut off from the people of God and bound to your dumb idols. They were alienated from the commonwealth of Israel. Now, Paul is talking in a very general sense here. He's not talking about proselytes. I'm not going to get into that. But in a general sense, that was the condition of the Gentiles. They were not welcomed among the community of God's old covenant people. They couldn't enjoy the light that was given only to the Jews. And the Jews were, in fact, by and large, entirely segregated from the Gentiles by specific laws of cleanness and uncleanness. But God used all those laws, those tedious laws that we read about in the books of Moses. This is clean. This is unclean. What was he doing with that? Well, in one part, one large reason for that is he was separating them from the nations. That's how they maintained their separation, even when they went into captivity because of those laws. And in fact, the coveted sign of circumcision was one of the most powerful means of separation, wasn't it? The Gentiles could not enjoy all of the tabernacle and temple benefits which were accessible to the Jews alone and which enabled the people to draw near to the true and living God by means of daily sacrifices and ritual practices. They were excluded from that blessing that belonged to Israel. The Gentiles were strangers to the covenants. Think about that. Those precious covenants which God had made with the people, his people, the people of Israel, that he made through Abraham and through Moses and through Joshua and through David and through Solomon and Nehemiah, and you can go on, all those covenants that were reiterated and renewed, they were to the Jews. Gentiles had no part in them. They were barred from them. They were incapable of joining them in the first place, let alone renewing them. And the summary design of those covenants, the most important element of those covenants, was the fact that God would be their God and they would be his people. That was at the base of those covenants. In a general sense, the Gentiles, again, we're not talking about proselytes, but the Gentiles had no part in this. They were strangers, we're told, to the covenants and to God's precious promises. And because of this, they were, until the present, Paul says, without hope and without God in the world. Think about that. Their entire lives were empty and vain. They were doomed to enjoying temple things for a season, only to be cast into outer darkness beyond the grave. They were like Cain. God allowed Cain to enjoy life in this world for a time for the sake of his broader plan, but Cain was cursed. Cain was an outcast. He had no relationship with God. Indeed, the Gentiles had no fellowship with the true and living God ever. Can you imagine, brethren, being born into this glorious and profound creation? Can you imagine taking part in the profound and glorious reality of life itself? Being a living being with a living soul created in the image and likeness of your designer, and that designer is only your enemy and judge forever. Wouldn't it have been better to have never been born? Living every day in the pursuit of material things and sinful lusts that can never ever satisfy apart from any connection or relation to your God, to the God who created all the wonders and all of the things that we see and enjoy. There's no relationship with him. And then to meet this God for the first time as the object of his fiery wrath and to continue in that state utterly ruined and eternally tormented forever. What a horror. By and large, that was the state of the Gentiles until Christ came. 
without hope, without God in the world. And sadly, that is the present state of some in this room this morning. Some of you can identify with that. But it doesn't have to continue that way. But it presently is that way, isn't it? And so the apostle reminds his Ephesian readers that that was the condition in which the grace of God had finally met them. They were lost and dead, living in darkness, presently condemned, and they were on a conveyor belt straight to hell beyond any naturally, uh, beyond any natural reach of hope whatsoever. But then notice what Paul says secondly. He wants them to remember that. He wants them to not lose sight of their former condition. But then Paul moves on secondly to talk about God's grace now to the Gentiles. Look at verse 13. But now, he says, remember you were, but now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. What a profound privilege. What a blessing beyond all blessings. But now, Paul says, but now something has changed. And that, no thanks to you, but all glory to God, who in the fullness of time caused the light of his grace to shine beyond the borders of Israel and into the whole world. But now, in Christ Jesus, in the arrival of this one individual into time and space, in your union with the beloved Son of God, God incarnate, who came into this world to extend the borders of God's grace to every nation and people through his own substitutionary sacrifice. In him, you who were once, who were once this, who were once far off, you were once without hope and without God in the world. You were aliens to the commonwealth and covenants of God's people. But now you have been brought near. And brethren, here's the profound nature of this reality. Not simply as near as the Jews were permitting. Even the Jews, while enjoying the benefits of temple worship, were still limited in their ability to approach God. They had to continually come with blood sacrifices and all manner of offerings just to reach the outer door of the temple, just to reach the courtyard of the temple. But only the priests could enter into the holy place on their behalf, separated from the most holy place by a large thick veil, which is where the presence of God was most profoundly revealed. And only the high priest could enter the most holy place, and that once a year on the Day of Atonement. And even the view of the high priest was limited because he couldn't enter the most holy place without lighting the incense altar first so that smoke would cover the mercy seat and the, uh, the, the covenants of God, the, the ark of God's covenant. It had to cover it so that it would shield him from even clear access to that as the high priest. So there was always these barriers. But now, Paul says, the Gentiles even could be brought right into the most holy place of God's heavenly tabernacle as often as they pleased through the once for all time sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ. The thick veil. That veil was thick and long. You could cut that with shears. It was torn in two from top to bottom. Symbolizing this reality, symbolizing that it was God who opened the way up, uh, the way in. And what a tremendous increase in privilege. Brethren, consider the gradient or the slope of that privilege if you were able to chart it. Some of you are good with charts. Chart the increase in privilege for the Gentiles. Consider the infinite gap of what it means to have once been far off, 
but now to have been brought near in that schematic. How powerful and glorious was Christ's offering? Even Gentiles were taken from the absolute farthest and darkest position on earth, only to be brought right into the very throne room of God, as it were, even into the heavenly throne room, and as often as they like. You see, Paul wants his readers and us today to see and appreciate the profound nature of what Christ has accomplished on our behalf to this end. He says, stop and remember. Remember where you were. Remember how far you were from God. Look at your former life apart from God and Christ. He says, go back and see yourself there. And now look down and see where you presently stand. Look at the life that you now live in close fellowship with the living God. You're a beloved, adopted child of the living God. You're loved by God to the fullest and sincerest sense and granted full access to Him as often as you please. He delights when you come before Him. Remember, Paul says, don't take it for granted. Don't lose sight of that profound blessing and privilege given you in Christ. Remember, when you're tempted toward any manner of sin, he says, remember, when you're prone to complain about some hardship or trial in this life, remember, when you think that God has shortchanged you in some way, remember, when you're growing weary or you're tempted to give up. Remember. Remember where you were, where you now are, and the cross that made the difference. Brethren, we don't deserve any of this, do we? And if you are a Gentile, not that the Jews are deserving either, but if you are a Gentile, consider how many thousands of years your lineage has been given over to utter and complete darkness and hopelessness, all of which we naturally deserve. How many generations of our people were kept in darkness? Not because it's unfair that we were given light, but because we deserve the same thing and we've received grace. Grace has found us in Christ. Paul then sums up the whole matter in verses 14 through 16. He describes specifically what Christ's shed blood has accomplished, bringing about the ultimate merger of Jew and Gentile into one singular body, one church, ushered into the very presence of God as one people forever. Notice, he says, for he, that is for he, Christ himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances so that he might create in himself now one new man in place of the two, so making peace and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. Amen. Christ himself is our peace. Indeed, he has become our peace, specifically, Paul says, by conquering our sin, conquering the very cause of our enmity with God and others through his own shed blood and sacrificial offering once for all time. Through Christ's death, God's righteous wrath is appeased, and we now have peace with God in Christ. The consequence of our sins, which have estranged us, estranged us from God, has been dealt with in full at the cross. And he is also the means of bringing about peace between Jew and Gentile and between all nations for that matter. And brethren, without going off on a tangent, 
That is one of the reasons that one of the most dangerous teachings in our day today is critical race theory and this garbage that is in churches seeking to divide people on the basis of ethnicity. It's a reverse of all that Christ has done. It's to say that Christ has not brought peace. He has made both Jew and Gentile one. He has united that which was once intentionally separated by all manner of ceremonial laws and ordinances by fulfilling and bringing an end to the, those very laws that once, did not, uh, that once divided them. Peter, kill and eat. Lord, I can't. I've never eaten anything unclean. Do not say that what God has made clean or sanctified is unclean. Kill and eat, Peter. Lord, I can't. I've never eaten anything unclean. Peter, what I have made clean, don't dare call it unclean. It wasn't about the food. It was about being able to bond and to become one with Gentiles. The necessity of those laws has now been removed. Christ has abrogated them through his own offering. And so he has broken down the wall of separation that once created the enmity, dividing Jew and Gentile, so that they could now be brought together as one new man in Christ. In this sense, there is no more Jew and Gentile. There is no more city nor slave. There is no more male and female in this sense. But all are one in Christ. By one offering, he has brought all people together, reconciled them all to God first in one body through his cross and thereby killing, putting to death the hostility between them as well. See, God had to deal first with our relationship with him. And once he dealt with the greater gap, the greater separation, then he could deal with the separation between us and others, Jew and Gentile. Paul here, in fact, intentionally uses a visual example to help bring home the main point that he's trying to get across here. An example that these Ephesians and those around Paul would have known very well based on what he was saying here. You see, at the temple, for those God-fearing Gentiles, who wished to in some way worship the true and living God, who had some in that category of Gentile, who wanted to honor the God of the Jews, and they wanted to have some benefit from the temple. Well, there was this outer court of the Gentiles, where the Gentiles could, albeit with great limitation, come within some distance of the temple. There was this, the temple, there was this outer court. But there were signs posted throughout this court that were nailed or put to the walls that warned the Gentiles not to dare step foot into the next courtyard. There were guards who were there to ensure that a Gentile did not cross into the inner, the next courtyard closer to the temple. And that next court, which allowed for the Jews to come in, and especially Jewish women and children were allowed to go that distance, was separated from the Gentiles, and then there was another wall. And that other court moving inward was for the men. The men could go even further than the women and the children. And then they were separated by another wall. And then you came to the priests, and then ultimately to the temple building itself, which was separated by a door. And all of these courts were separated by walls with fierce warnings being given. You had temple police not to travel beyond your, your own designated sphere of allowance based on your ethnicity, your sex, and your priestly qualification. But here, Paul says that from the standpoint of God and his heavenly tabernacle, all of those dividing walls have been torn down in Christ. Permitting all who are united to Christ by faith to enter into the most holy place, not even the next inner court, but the most holy place to access God freely and equally and as often as you like as one man in Christ. Both Jew and Gentile, equally and desperately needing Christ, are brought in as one man, accessing God to the full without any, without any distinction whatsoever. Now the wall 
stood up for a while longer, even though from a spiritual standpoint, God had torn it down in Christ. But in AD 70, when the temple was destroyed, I believe that that was the visible fulfillment of this spiritual reality that had come to fruition. Indeed, Christ was actually crucified where? Outside of the city. And he sanctified that which was unclean. Remember, where did the Jews take everything, all the unclean remnants of the dead animals that weren't offered? Outside of the city to a faraway place. Jesus was crucified outside the city. He sanctified the outside of the city area. He sanctified what was unclean. And he shifted the curse of uncleanness, as it were, into the city. Represented by the false teachings of Judaism that yet remain there even to the present day. It's only when the Jews receive the gospel that the curse is removed and salvation is brought back to the people. That's why it's significant that when Jesus is being crucified or on his way to be crucified, what did the Jews say? His blood be upon us and our children. And that's why the prophet says, some of which took place already, that it's until they look upon him whom they have pierced, that they will come to repentance and God will grant them that liberty that has been given to the Gentiles. And so again, as a compelling motivation unto the wholehearted obedience that the apostle here, as a motivation unto wholehearted obedience that's to come in the commands in chapters 4 and following, the apostle reminds his Gentile readers of the immeasurable riches of God's grace which has reached them both individually in their conversion and corporately in the expansion of the kingdom of God into the Gentile world which was once given over to total darkness. Now Paul's going to continue with this theme to the end of chapter 3 showing God's ultimate plan and bringing the two to one and how God is glorified in that reality. But brethren, let me just close with the concluding thoughts for you. Just to conclude, something to think about in light of what we've gone over. First, brethren, first, consider the magnitude of the privilege that you and I have been given to be included among those who are part of Christ's church. We don't think as highly of the privilege that we've been given just to gather with God's people. But we ought to. How many entire generations of people were bound and chained to a dispensation of absolute darkness in the course of the unfolding of the history of this world? Why were you here today and not part of that generation? Why were you allowed to see and to be part of this glorious plan? There are people today even who have never so much as heard of the Lord Jesus Christ and his gospel. There are people who will live this life only to die having never ever known the joy of relating directly to the God who created all things. They'll never experience that joy. And when they meet God for the first time, they will only know his displeasure and his wrath forever. Can you fathom that? As a being given the gift of life in this world, to have that kind of an experience forever? Never take for granted the fact that the living God has invaded your life and has thrust a new heart into your chest and has given you eyes to see the glory of his son and his eternal kingdom, brethren. Never take it for granted. People lust after fame. People wish to be the winning team in some temporal, unfulfilling sport. People hunger and thirst to win championships and they invest in worthless, dying aspirations that can take them no further than the grave. They have been duped by the devil and they crave for more of that which is not true life. But you, brethren, you have been brought into the church of the living God, the glorious union of all of God's people who having been rescued from Adam's curse are united to his son. 
living presently in an eternal kingdom which carries over and into eternal glory. It's not that you're going to get eternal life. If you're in Christ, you have it already. Remember what you were. Consider where you are and treasure the grace that has brought you from such a devastatingly helpless state to the glorious state that you're now in. Brethren, let me say it this way, and this is no exaggeration. There is no one more blessed in this entire planet than you. If you're in Christ this morning, if you are a Christian, there is no one more blessed on this entire planet than you. Take these precious embers of truth and place them in the furnace of your heart and fan them. Ponder them, and when the steam of God's grace and love toward you so fills your soul that you need to find a way to release it, be prepared to release it in the direction of obeying the imperatives that are coming in chapters 4 through 6. That's what Paul's doing here. He's preparing us so that we will be ready to embrace those commands because we would make every excuse not to obey what's given to us in the later part of this book until we remember and understand what God has done for us in Christ. If you're not a Christian this morning, then you are still living in the darkness that Paul has described here concerning the former state of the Gentiles. You're in a pitiful state if you're not a Christian. If you're not a Christian, you are presently living under the wrath of God, your creator. You're in darkness, but the light of the gospel is put before you yet again this morning so that you might come out of that darkness and into the light of Christ to fellowship with God in the present and obtain eternal life. Eternal life is before you today. You're not amongst those Gentile nations that were outside and cursed and had no light. You have light. You have light in this room right here and now more than most in the world have. There's hope for you if you would but repent of your sins and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. If you would but believe the gospel, simply call upon the name of the Lord, ask him to save you, believe that he's died for your sins, and embrace him by faith and follow him and you will be saved and God will communicate with you through his word and you will have the light of life and have the pleasure of being a part of Christ church. May God give you the grace to consider these things as we take the supper now. If you're unsaved, you won't be taking the supper with us, but please think about these things. You can pray, have dealings with God even now for the next few minutes. Let's pray. Father, we do give you thanks for the wonderful truths that we've just considered in your word. <clears throat> Father, we confess that we do not appreciate what you have done. We are so dull of heart. We are so blind sometimes to these realities. We have a hard time remembering those things that we need to remember most. And Father, even when we remember them, we are so prone to losing sight of them just in the course of one day's affairs. We ask, Lord, for your people today in this room that we would be a people who diligently pursue remembering. That we would think about constantly who we are in Christ and how we got here. That we would remember that generations of people, of our people, were given over to darkness that we deserve. And that you've been gracious to us. And we pray that it would put a fire deep into our souls that would not be quenched. And that we would thrust ourselves forward desiring to give our lives for the glory of Christ and his church. And Father, we ask for those who do not know you here this morning, we pray that you would work in their hearts. Lead them to cry out to you today, right here and now. Let nothing distract them from seeking you. Let these seeds take root in fertile soil that has been turned over by the Holy Spirit. And bless our time now as we take this up. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Today's community reading is Hebrews 3, 12 through 19. Take care, brothers, lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart, leading you to fall away from the living God. But 
exhort one another every day, as long as it is called today, that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. For we have come to share in Christ, if indeed we hold our original confidence firm to the end. As it is said, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in rebellion. For those who heard and yet not yet rebelled, what was it not all those who left Egypt by led by Moses? And with whom was he provoked for forty years? Was it not with those who sinned, whose bodies fell in the wilderness? And to whom did he swear that he will not and would not enter his rest? But to those who were disobedient. So we see that he so we see that they were unable to enter because of unbelief. May God bless you. As we prepare to take the supper, brethren, let's rejoice in what we've just heard. Thinking about that the Jews were the ones who took the Passover, right? If you weren't circumcised, you didn't take the Passover. You didn't belong. You were separated. You didn't benefit from the old covenant in that sense. But in the new covenant, brethren, it doesn't matter whether you're circumcised or not. It doesn't matter where you, what kind of clothing you wear and the seeds you sow. And all those kinds of ceremonial issues are done away with in Christ. No matter who you are, no matter where you come from, if you're in Christ, you're welcome to this table. As a reminder of what Christ has done for us, as a reminder that God has a contract with us, that he has a covenant with us based freely on grace. What better covenant can you have with someone than a covenant of grace when the one who's made that covenant with you is the one who has obligated himself and has lowered himself for your benefit so that you can freely receive and as we take of this supper, we're reminded that we are in a covenant of grace. And the blood of that covenant is not from us. Our blood could not satisfy God's justice. It's from the shed blood of Christ. It's his broken body. It's his shed blood. This he did for us. And so, brethren, as we saw in the sermon this morning, let's, let's remember as we take of this supper. Let's not be casual about it. Let's remember what God has done for us to reach us in Christ and let's profess and proclaim his death until he comes. If you're not a Christian, if you're not in Christ, if he is not your Lord and Savior, do not take. The supper is not for you. You may say you're interested in these things. Seek him now. Pray now. And come back next time. Come meet with us. Talk to us. You may have questions. There are many here who can help answer those questions. But make sure if you're not in Christ that you just hold off. If you have bitterness towards someone else, here among us in this body and it's unresolved or unwilling to resolve that, that conflict that may be between you and someone else, I would say resolve that first or at least try to resolve it before you take this supper. This is communion. This is a gathering together of one of the saints. If you're not one with someone, then there's a problem. And if you're living in sin and you're unwilling to repent of that sin, if you're holding on to something, you say, I'm not going to let this go. Whatever it is, you may think it's small, but if it's sin, you're unwilling to let it go. Do not take of this supper until you deal with that sin. Confess it. Even now, confess it. Repent of it. And then come and take the supper. It's for those who still are in the battle, who still find themselves struggling with sin and in need of grace. But you're in that battle and you're in Christ. Let's pray. Father, as we take of the supper together, we thank you that it is representative of the glorious covenant of grace that you've made with us through Christ, that he is the mediator of that covenant, and that it's on the basis of his shed blood and his broken body and what he has accomplished for us. All we are are free recipients of this covenant who come by faith, and even that faith is a gift from you. Oh Lord, bless our time together. Help us to remember. Be gracious to us. And we ask that you would bless our time now together in the taking of these elements. We pray in Christ's name.
Pastor Evans, um, just the darkness in the world, and this week I was thinking about just the importance of, of our perspective, and oftentimes it seems that we only shift our perspective a little bit, and yet it changes so much about how we live our lives. The Apostle Peter said in, in, in 1 Peter 3, 15, be prepared to give an answer for the hope that you have in Christ Jesus, and the implication I get from that is that when we are walking out our faith, people are seeing a difference much in the same way. If we lose weight, it makes people curious. They say, hey, how did you do that? What's going on? When we, we are people of hope, and when we live out that hope, people notice it. And it's simply a shift, a slight shift away from our hope that will cause us to live in fear. And so I, I wanted to leave you with this today. This hymn, just focusing on our Lord. Oh, soul, are you weary and troubled? Oh, why in the darkness you see? There's light for a look at the same.
Honor your father and mother. And he said to him, Teacher, all these have I kept from my youth. And Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said to him, You lack one thing. Go, sell all that you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. And come, follow me. Disheartened by the saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had many great possessions. God from whom all blessings flow, praise Him. 